corporate fraud works best in the shadows, behind corporate walls. How does the government bring these wrongdoers to justice? Whistleblowers. These are the stories of those who risk their careers to shine a light on allegations of fraud. Today on Fraud in America. Today on this episode of Fraud in America, we are heading to the University of Pennsylvania Wharton School of Business to speak to Francine McKenna. While she currently spends most of her time as a full-time Wharton lecturer teaching the nuances of the accounting world, her long storied career includes multiple stops along the way. She began her career in big accounting, including as a managing director at KPMG, and a director at PwC. She then ventured in-house with a senior position at J.P. Morgan in the early 2000s. Then, in 2006, she shifted career paths and became an investigative reporter and feature writer for several top-tier publications, including the Wall Street Journal, Dow Jones Market Watch, Forbes, American Banker, and the Financial Times. Her stories on public company accounting Fraud and financial investigations received numerous awards and acclaim. In 2019, she launched an independent newsletter known as The Dig, where to this day she scrutinizes accounting, audit, and corporate governance issues at public and pre-IPO companies. However, she recognized that her greatest impact might be in influencing students before they ventured into the corporate world. So, in 2022, she took on the full-time lecture position at Wharton, where she teaches financial accounting to MBA students. On today's episode, Professor McKenna shares the lessons she has learned about corporate and accounting fraud over the last 40 years, and explains why she is so optimistic about the future of the business world. That all happens on today's episode, but first... A special thank you to the National Whistleblower Law Firm of Getnick & Getnick, whose generous support makes this show possible in 2023. And now, today's episode of Fraud in America. Well, Francine, welcome to today's show. Thank you for having me. So, uh, you're... Um, uh, in Steinberg Dietrich Hall, I imagine, uh, my old stomping grounds at Penn, you're a, a lecturer, full-time lecturer now at Wharton, but uh, you haven't always been there. I, I, I was diving into your background, and I found it fascinating, uh, all your different stops along the way, which leads you to where you are today. Can you talk a little bit about how that has, uh, why these different stops, uh, accounting seems to be the through line through all these different areas, and how that has helped you where you are now? Sure, um, that is true. Uh, sometimes I say it's kind of a scattered dot plot, but accounting is sort of the, the line through the, the scattered dot plot. And you you sometimes have to take a few detours, um, but I think the, 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 the prize is, is always in my eyes, um, or it was, uh, or it all starting to make sense now at this advanced age. Um, so let me try to go backward. Um, I came to Wharton uh, in uh, last fall, and it was because at a time in my life and with everything that we've all gone through with the pandemic and um, you know worrying about family and worrying about what was going to happen in the future, uh, I decided maybe it was a good time to write uh, part-time and teach full-time. I had been writing full-time and teaching part-time in Washington, D.C. for about six years. Uh, that was a full-time role at Market Watch, where some of my uh, work was also appearing in the Wall Street Journal and in Barron's, et cetera. And so I was writing full-time uh, and I was teaching part-time at American University in their MBA program, their online program but I was teaching international business because I have worked uh, quite a bit outside of the US in particular in Latin America in the past. And they said, oh, well, you know, you don't have to teach accounting. Uh, the MBAs would really love to hear about all your experiences. So I spent 
uh, almost six years in DC writing. Uh, that was actually my first newsroom job. Again, uh, at 53, I got my first newsroom job. <laughs> so don't don't tell don't let anybody tell you uh, journalism is dying. You know, if you have a, a, a niche, if you're a subject matter expert. Um, in particular, in undercovered areas like accounting and audit, uh, there's always somebody who needs something at some point in time. We're in that kind of golden era right now where there's a lot of calling for uh, uh, people who can write and talk about accounting and audit, given all the bank failure stuff and all of the frauds and just everything that's going on. Before I was at uh, Market Watch in Washington, D.C., I was writing freelance for a variety of publications, um, Forbes for a long time, American Banker for a long time. I wrote a column. Uh, I would write for whoever would be interested in accounting or audit. So I wrote some columns at the FT, getting quoted a lot, this and that. So a little bit of everything, including writing for um, the Chicago Booth Review, which is the academic sort of research journal at uh, the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business, which probably was my first taste of real academia and trying to get used to the idea of, you know, writing in a different style than maybe what I had started to become accustomed to um, in the journalism style. Uh, before I was freelance writing, um, I started writing uh, in 2006. And in 2006, as you recall, that was pre-crisis. Um, I had been working at PwC as a director in uh, the group that was auditing the firm itself. And that was a really interesting period because it was post Sarbanes-Oxley a few years. The firms were still uh, pure audit firms because three out of four had sold their uh, consulting firms at that time. Mm -hmm. So it was a really interesting period to be looking at how um, one of the major firms was re reinventing itself as more of a pure audit firm. But I left PwC in 2006 and decided maybe I would write a book. And the best way to uh, get an agent to write a book, if you're not in academia or you're not affiliated with a big firm, at that time, somebody, said, somebody suggested write a blog. And so I started a blog in 2006 and got in at the beginning of the crisis, um, writing about mortgage-backed securities, writing about how um, you know there was all this potential fraud related to the valuation of mortgage-backed securities, which nobody was buying at that time. The fraud thesis really didn't become prominent until um, the uh, Tony Velukas bankruptcy examiner report on Lehman Brothers, where he called out Ernst & Young, their auditor, uh, as part of the problem, not part of the solution to what happened at Lehman Brothers. So my career in journalism took off. I had a, came to a fork in the road and I had to sort of choose. And that's when I chose the journalism role because I thought I, I could never go back to a firm. Previous to PwC though, I had also worked uh, for KPMG for quite a long time. Um, and became a managing director there in the, on the consulting side. I was the project management office uh, director for JP Morgan for the year 2000 project in Latin America. So I led the project to save JP Morgan from the Y2K bug. Uh, so that's where I spent a lot of time outside of the US. And prior to that, I worked in a couple of industrial companies and my first job out of college with an accounting degree was at Continental Illinois National Bank and Trust in mm. the early 80s. So I was there after the Penn Square issue arose, yeah. but before the funding crisis and when it was taken over um, eventually by uh, uh, Bank of America. So my career started out of college with an accounting degree in an internal audit role at a bank, which was the first too big to fail bank. So I, I, I say that that was really the genesis of my cynical attitude and probably <laughs> the, the harbinger of what I was probably gonna do for the rest of my life is try to figure out how do these things happen? And in particular, um, why did the auditors never raise their hand about it? So, what an amazing career. It's been really interesting to try to chart it out. Why I, I, 
use my dry erase board to try to map out all the different stops. <laughs> really fascinating career. Uh, so we originally were planning on doing this about three weeks ago. Since then, the world seems to have gone in a different direction. Uh, uh, Silicon Valley Bank uh, closure, Signature Bank closure, a bunch of other financial institutions seem to be uh, propped up by a lot of deposits from other banks. And there's a lot of questions involving the financial markets right now. It feels a little bit like 08 in some regards. Um, you ended your last point with, you know, how does this happen? How does fraud happen, especially in these large public companies that have accounting departments and auditors and transparency? How, how does fraud happen at these big companies? So I, I've been having some conversations um, uh, recently about this because I think often um, when uh, those who don't have to deal with fraud all the time, journalists or perhaps even attorneys or even professionals um, in, other, in other realms, when they see it pop up in bunches like this, sometimes they have sort of a misunderstanding about what we're really talking about. And we're not talking now, and we were not talking in the financial crisis about some individual uh, executive deciding that they were going to cheat their employer and either embezzle funds or somehow find a way to personally benefit from um, manipulating the financial records. This is not what we're talking about, although that happens all the time, right? Insider yep. trading, uh, embezzlement, uh, individual um, executives who do uh, you know, bad things inside and outside of work that, that affect the reputation of their employers and, and their own reputations. But what we're talking about here and what we were talking about in the crisis is we're talking about systemic fraud within an institution and sometimes systemic fraud within a particular industry. Banks are not the only ones where this happens, although banks, obviously, you know, the old joke, why did Jesse James rob banks? Well, because that's where the money is, right? So it's a concentration of wealth. It's a concentration of financial transactions that is you know, usually not replicated at any kind of industrial company, unless you're talking about uh, Berkshire Hathaway or, or GE or something like that in the old days. We're talking about um, ways of doing businesses, processes that are that become corrupt over time. So what makes an institution um, go down that slippery slope, or I should say go from being every once in a while some mistake occurs or a misstatement occurs or someone, you know, has a weakness or a system has a weakness to an overall kind of method of doing business that becomes corrupt. What happens is that there is complacency, there is impunity um, in the society as a whole. Mm. You have just sort of this understanding that this is the way the business is done. This is the way capitalism works. This is the way you have to do things in order to be successful. This is what the expectation is. This is what is competitively necessary. If we don't do it, then we're not, we're not going to be able to compete with our peer group. Whether it's a bank trying to get an edge on, in, on trading whether it's an in, a industrial company trying to get an edge on getting a, obtaining a contract, uh, whether overseas or, or local, this is about systemic corruption within an institution or within an industry uh, or a business model that says, we're not going to pay attention to the guideposts, we're not going to pay attention to the rules, which are often very well established. So. It's not that we don't have laws or regulations that say many of the things that we're seeing are not supposed to be done. It's not that we don't have wonderful people who know all about risk management practices and internal controls. It's that they're ignored. And when people identify that they have been violated, there is no enforcement. And one of the biggest problems post Sarbanes-Oxley, Sarbanes-Oxley, the law that was passed to try to bring integrity back to the auditing profession. That was really the purpose of Sarbanes-Oxley. We had lost confidence in the auditing profession and process because of Arthur Anderson, 
that they could identify that they would act in a situation like Enron. That was the gist of the law. That was the focus of the law. It wasn't really about the corporations themselves and their processes. It was about how do we get auditors back to doing auditing and raising their hands about issues. But what's happened is that much of what was put in place in Sarbanes-Oxley was never enforced. And now we have Dodd-Frank, which is post-crisis, and we have many of the rules that were never even written. For example, the rules that related to uh, executive compensation in banks and how it was not supposed to be driven by uh, uh, un unreasonably risky incentives. That rule was never written. The SEC has not, has not implemented that rule yet. It's more than 10 years later. So it's not that we don't have good intentions and good people in many organizations. It's that when you develop a culture of impunity, you develop a culture of um, uh, 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 just complacency about the norms and the rule of law, and it's not enforced, then people start believing that this is what you have to do in order to be successful. This is what you have to do to be to compete. And uh, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger until, of course, um, we have we see these occasional um, uh, blow ups. It certainly feels like right now we're at a, a pendulum swing, right? I 100 percent agree with what you said. You know, it feels like there's a tremendous call volume, at least that we're getting at taxpayers against fraud and our member attorneys are getting from people saying, you know, this is what's happening. And you're left with saying, is this really what's happening? <laughs> the, 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 the just blatant violations of existing laws that are not being enforced, which then leads to people stepping forward and, and taking on the role of highlighting blatant fraud. You know, you said something earlier about, you know, it becomes kind of the mantra or the uh, accepted norm. It reminds me of that line from the Wall Street, um, greed is good, right? <laughs> that becomes kind of the mantra. And it feels like we're back to where we were pre-Sarbanes-Oxley. It feels a little bit like Enron right now to me. Well, um, uh, there are many, many uh, parallels to Enron. What I will say is that, um, I've had sort of a, I, I have still hope, uh, hope in the future, hope in youth, uh, mm. the youth uh, of, the, <laughs> of the future, the professionals of the future. And the reason is because um, I, uh, I personally never had an opportunity to uh, get an MBA. I had a working MBA. I worked and I, I traveled and I did a lot of things and I had a, was a journeyman apprentice MBA. Now I'm teaching MBAs at elite, at elite schools. And when I first was in, uh, had the opportunity to encounter sort of well, what are MBAs really being taught at these schools was back um, uh, in 2016, 2017, I uh, was a journalism fellow at the Stigler Center at the University of Chicago. So the center that is focused on sort of the intersection between business and politics, um, all of those issues around regulatory uh, capture and revolving door and all that they want, they do a wonderful job focusing on those issues. And they started a program to get journalists more um, involved in academic activities and research around finance and, and economics so that obviously they could write better about them and they could have good resources um, available to them in terms of academics that are studying these issues. So they started a program and part of the program was it was a three-month fellowship where we would, you know, be exposed to everything in the business school, um, but also have lots of um, uh, seminars and workshops and things. But also we had the opportunity to choose to take, sit in on three classes in the business school. And I thought that was worth the price of the ticket for me because I was really curious about what um, was being taught to the, the new future masters of the universe at, at mm -hmm. these elite schools. I was pleasantly um, pleased to find that the MBA program, the full-time MBA program at University of Chicago at that time was not the stereotypical Chicago school, not the stereotypical, um, you know, shareholder primacy and, you know, Milton Friedman. And, and it was very diverse, culturally, uh, gender diverse, uh, globally diverse, diverse in terms of thought and experience of the students, 
Um, and the faculty was also quite diverse in their viewpoints and their experience and what they brought to the table. So I had a wonderful time and I thought, wow, well, this is good. This is, this is good. Students are not being taught, you know, greed is good and money is, is, right. the, is the king and, you know, and do whatever you have to do and, you know, utilitarian kind of stuff. And now I'm teaching at Wharton and um, I'm teaching a required accounting course. And of course you have students who are going to be, you know, really uh, amazing people in business and finance, uh, potentially in politics, in not-for-profit, in, in every aspect of, of the, the intersection of business and, and the economy. And again, I'm very, very happy to say that um, the students are incredibly diverse. They come from everywhere in the world. They have lots of backgrounds and they are very intellectually curious about um, every viewpoint. So they're not stuck yes. in a groove in terms of only one thing, other than the fact that maybe many of them are spending a lot of time and money to get this degree and they wanna do well and they wanna get a good job out of it, right? Sure. Sure. But how they wanna spend their time, how they are willing to earn their money, what they wanna do with their lives, I think is really, really thoughtful and, 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 and broad and, and, and wonderful. And so I'm having a really, really good time teaching because I can teach the applied accounting to these real life cases, of what's going on in the world today. And I'm grateful that they're actually interested in that because they see that uh, they don't wanna be talking theory. They don't wanna be you know, put in a, you know, in a group they want to actually be able to think about the issues that they're going to face out there in the real world. And they want, I think, for the most part, to do the right thing. Uh, you're giving us hope. That's that's great, Francine. That's very good to hear. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how fraud gets onto the radar at a company, at a corporation, uh, you know, that ultimately leads to some kind of internal investigation so that they look into these allegations. How do those allegations of fraud first reach the company internally? So if you were to look at the statistics, um, the ACFE um, will tell you that the majority of fraud is identified by insiders. Um, whistleblowers are the vast majority of those who raise the issue of potential um, material misstatements or fraud in a company. And the question is, is whether or not those concerns um, find fertile ground within the company in a supportive environment. In addition to whistleblowers, which again is the vast majority, you have lots of mechanisms within a company that are supposed to identify when things are going wrong or going askew. You have in most large corporations and in general, it's required by listing standards to have an internal audit department, right? So it's recommended, it's highly uh, uh, regarded, it's generally uh, uh, in use, but it's not necessarily always um, the strongest um, uh, uh, tool in the tool chest. Why? Because in the end, internal auditors are employees of the company. And so they always are going to be stressed and pressured by that mixed motive. But internal auditors, again, professionals, I know some amazing people who have devoted their lives and their careers to doing a good job as internal auditors and IT auditors within companies. And they are supposed to be looking and identifying and, and defending the company against those or what might, uh, might harm it. They produce reports. They are supposed to have a direct line to the board. They are supposed to be, you know, uh, treated with respect and obviously as objective or independent as they possibly can be within a particular environment. But again, that challenge to be independent and objective at all times or to not succumb to pressure um, is, is often the hardest thing. Internal auditors are often the first line to investigate when someone else identifies something within the company. Um, why? Just because they're there already and they have the skills, they have the tool kits, they have the ability to obtain whatever support they need. In addition, you have the regular line managers, right? Every line manager, every line staff should be imbued with the company's ethics and code of conduct, should understand its policies and procedures, 
should be coached and supported to identify issues and, and, and to raise them when they see them. We would want the company not to be taken advantage of. We would want the company not to be uh, uh, losing money. We would want the company not to have things, you know, leaking out the sides. And you would think that most employees would um, be in favor of that. But as you know, many whistleblowers find that they're stressed because raising your hand and raising an issue is sometimes shooting yourself and your fellow employees in the foot, right? If you raise an issue that damages the reputation of the company uh, in the public or damages the company in the market, um, you may be also hurt and you may be hurting your fellow employees, your colleagues, because of course the share price goes down or you have you know, the company stressed financially and then you have people laid off, et cetera, et cetera. You may have a forced acquisition, et cetera. So there's that push pull of, I wanna do the right thing and I wanna protect the company, but actually raising my hand might also in the short term harm the company and therefore harm myself or harm people that I care about. And then you have the other defense mechanisms. You have, of course, senior management in the board, which sadly is often way too remote and sometimes puts in uh, some kind of mechanism of plausible deniability. They don't want to know what they don't want to know, right? Because <laughs> they become uh, too imbued with the idea that they need to defend themselves or worry about their own liability rather than uh, protecting the company. Then you have the external auditors, right? So the external auditors are supposed to be that important leg of the stool, almost the regulator or the external law enforcement inside the company, independent, objective, looking out for the shareholders, that's their client. But as we know, the model says the company pays the external auditors. And so you've already um, you know, chipped away at their, at their armor, their ability to protect themselves and protect shareholders because they're already compromised by having their master be the company itself. So we have many, many examples where it's not the external auditor that raises their hand and highlights an issue. They're often reactive. They're often also worried about their own liability and they're not the ones raising their hand and saying, we have a problem here unless it's to, uh, again, limit their own liability. And then you have outside regulators, law enforcement, um, safety and health, uh, departments of states and federal government, FTC, et cetera, CFPB and the banks, all the different regulatory agencies. They're on the outside and they may have some power to either subpoena or to gain information about what's going on in the inside, but it's a very, very adversarial situation in most cases. It's rarely a cooperative one. So when we have that three-legged stool of the company's own internal mechanisms like internal audit or its management, its board, working in conjunction with the external auditor and then uh, external regulators, we have to look and say, is the stool really balanced? Do you have the proper amount of authority and power um, within each of those uh, uh, legs of the stool? And will you have something that will surface? And the question is, is when it's whistleblowers that are raising the issues most of the time, who is looking out for them? Mm. Certainly not company management because they become defensive and protective. They close ranks. Certainly not the external auditor. They don't want to know what they don't want to know because then they're going to have either lose a client or they're going to defend themselves about why they didn't see it first. And it should be perhaps the external regulators and law enforcement because they should welcome that because they otherwise wouldn't have as good of information. However, they too are part of that institutional protective layer. And we've seen this with uh, banks and in particular with iconic sort of major, major employers, market market cap companies, regulators and law enforcement often don't want to upset the apple cart and damage any companies, and in particular banks, because they're concerned about systemic risk. They're concerned about people losing jobs. They're concerned about that collateral damage from taking a company down or take, gosh, God forbid, taking a bank down. So there's all this mitigation of the collateral damage that a whistleblower in particular might be able to inflict. So the question is, is 
Who actually wants whistleblowers or anybody else to tell you what's wrong with public corporations? Well, last bastion of maybe those who might identify or defend uh, uh, shareholders in the markets are journalists. Well, journalists are the farthest on the outside. And they're depending on all of the remaining parties that we talked about for information. Right, right. So in, investigative reporters, a, a dying breed, although you gave us some hope on the front end talking about you know finding your niche within journalism. And then uh, on a previous episode, we talked uh, about the Nikola Motors matter in which uh, an activist short seller, Hindenburg Research, uncovered some potential problems at that company and others. Um, this kind of, I guess, outside of the stool, right? We have the investigative reporters and short sellers and, and whistleblowers, although they are oftentimes inside. But we have independent analysis like Harry Markopoulos and, and others who've been able to identify things and, and bring it to the SEC's attention and receive whistleblower rewards. It's an interesting time right now, right, Francine? I agree. And thank you for reminding me about short sellers, activists, research, independent research, because I didn't mean to forget about it, but um, uh, but we often don't think of them as part of this sort of um, uh, typical or traditional mechanism for identifying wrongdoing within a company. It's a fairly recent phenomenon. Um, recent, I mean, like in the last 20 years, uh, 20, 25 years. It's a, a fraught phenomenon in that there are many, many, many critics of activists, short sellers in particular, or of independent um, uh, analysis like Harry Markopoulos. He's been definitely not uh, always uh, accepted or welcomed uh, when he had opinions. And so we have to look at that and say, how effective can they be? And I was actually just talking to a journalist uh, earlier today about the fact that uh, now the activist short seller who did Nicola um, now has a, a one-two punch with two really strong reports. Uh, I wrote about it in my newsletter about two strong reports, one about Adani, which is a, a firm, an Indian conglomerate. It's not listed on a U.S. exchange, but, but definitely a very, very large company with a, a large investment base. And now uh, Square Black, Black or Square, um, they just came out with another report. Again, very, very strong report. However, the activist short sellers have gotten really, really, really good at targeting uh, companies where they can uh, get sufficient evidence and they're spending a lot of time and money to make sure that they do those in independent investigations. They hire their own investigators. They do all kinds of research. The Black Square report, Hindenburg said, was two years in the making. I'm sure the Adani report was a long time coming because they are really, really, really detailed. However, whether it's Carson Black at Muddy Waters Research, whether it's uh, now Hindenburg or many of the others that have been um, successful in moving stock prices, they don't focus anymore primarily on accounting fraud. They focus on the business models often, that the business models are not successful business models, that the company is misleading you about the business model in some way or another. For example, it's misleading you about the source or the, um, the allocation of revenues. It's misleading you about its operational metrics or its performance metrics in other categories. It's misleading you about things that are non-GAAP metrics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Why is that? Because uh, it's been many, many years since an accounting fraud thesis was sufficient to bring a company down. Wow. And the reason is because nobody cares anymore. Companies can recover from accounting fraud allegations. Mm -hmm. The SEC is not making accounting fraud big cases. They're bringing disclosure fraud. We don't care how you do it. We just want you to tell the investors how you're doing it, whether it's pulling revenue forward or pushing revenue back or arranging uh, contracts with your vendors or however, or compensating your executives. 
The only time where they actually uh, really call it out as accounting fraud is when it seems to serve the purpose of individual executives from a compensation perspective. Mm -hmm. You could go back and look at some of the SEC enforcement actions related to accounting type issues, and almost always they're calling them disclosure fraud unless they can point, draw a line directly to specific executives manipulating those metrics or manipulating those numbers uh, in a self-serving way to drive uh, metrics that will force them to obtain an incentive comp or drive the share price so that they can cash out uh, uh, options or whatever, some kind of incentive thing. And then they'll actually um, also file a complaint against the, in, against the individual in, in, uh, executives. And if they find it to be intentional, scienter type, or some kind of conspiracy, or you know, where they misled the auditor and they misled the board, and they you know, really, really bad, you know, uh, mis misleading about material numbers then you might see also a criminal prosecution of the executives, not necessarily the company, but the executives. Mm -hmm. So what you're seeing is that there's a reluctance to call accounting fraud accounting fraud because it ruins companies and it ruins people's jobs and it ruins the, it, it causes confidence in the market to, to, to flail. And nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to do that. And so unless it's absolutely necessary, they won't call it out. And I will tell you that the activist short sellers follow that pattern because they know the stock is not going to move on some technical accounting issue. If you go back to Adani, for example, the Indian firm, Hindenburg was focused mostly on the business model, related party transactions, looking at how there was this, you know, governance issues about, you know, money moving back and forth between subsidiaries, um, just kind of that sloppiness. There are a lot of accounting issues in Adani and other reporters have followed up on those issues, but that was not the primary focus of the activist short seller report because they know that companies have recovered from accounting fraud allegations. Mm -hmm. Valiant, which turned into Bausch Health is another is a good one for that. Yep. You have um, um, uh, Herbalife in the past. Okay. Lots and lots of accounting fraud issue, but the issue was more about the business model and whether it would be called out as a as a, 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 a multi-level uh, marketing fraud. It wasn't, so nothing happened. Mattel, where there were actual allegations and private lawsuits about accounting fraud, about executives manipulating tax information, whistleblowers, et cetera, et cetera, they got away with an $8 million fine related to a disclosure fraud. Okay, not an accounting fraud. And so you have this very conscious decision to not focus on accounting fraud unless absolutely necessary and definitely not to focus on accounting fraud uh, with regard to the banks. Um, that's uh, disconcerting to hear in the wake of Arthur Anderson, and it, it feels like every 10 years, there's some accounting problem uh, that leads to a scandal, that leads to a recorrection, which leads to a statute that's later not followed by regulators. Um, what do we say then to potential whistleblowers that are coming to us from the big four or who are coming to us as in-house auditors? Um, what do you recommend we say to those people? Well, as you know, um being a whistleblower and actually being an either an internal auditor or an external auditor, um, there are some additional hurdles you have to leap. Why? Because it's your primary job to identify issues and material misstatements and potentially accounting or operational fraud. That's your job. So what do you have to do in, order, in terms of overcoming the fact that uh, it's your, this is your job to raise these issues and should, why should you get a whistleblower reward or why should you immediately tell um, the regulators instead of your own company? Well, you have to overcome um, the idea that your company did or didn't pay attention to you. So you have to wait a little bit of time. You have to also uh, make sure that you've gone up the chain, that you've been ignored or it's not being handled properly by the company itself. So there's additional hurdles. 
an external auditor has even more hurdles because they can't go and get a get a whistleblower reward for calling out fraud at an audit client. But they can get a whistleblower reward for calling out the fact that their own firm is committing securities fraud. Right. So how does their own firm commit securities fraud if you're an auditor? Well, they violate the securities laws related to how auditors are supposed to do audits and in particular, how auditors are supposed to be independent of their clients. And there have been whistleblowers for the audit firms uh, who, have, who have called out either the firms are violating labor laws, they're violating um, uh, local, uh, local laws and regulations about how they conduct their business, uh, tax laws, uh, and in particular auditor independence issues where they can't do a proper audit if they're not independent. So I, uh, you know, I used to tell internal and external auditors, you know, you have to make your own choices as an individual. What I hate to see is I hate to see in particular internal auditors um, get frustrated by not being paid attention to or not being respected, not having their issues handled properly, and then just kind of folding their tent and moving to another company. Right. Mm -hmm. Because we all know that often those issues are hurting people. Sometimes they're actually safety or environmental issues. That's what internal auditors are focused on more than financial issues. Sometimes they are employment issues. Sometimes they are things that people are being hurt. Employees are being hurt. The community is being hurt or the shareholders are being hurt because the company is not, uh, not optimizing its opportunities. External auditors, that's a tough one. They're very concerned about being blacklisted in the industry. They're very concerned about if they leave or if, they, if it becomes uh, public that they are reporting information about their firm to uh, the regulator, regulators uh, and other law enforcement authorities that they will never be hired by another firm again. And it's hard because you go to school, now you have to go to school for five years to, to be able to qualify uh, for a license in most states. Then you, you know, have to be licensed, pass a CPA exam, you have to do continuing professional education. You've devoted your life to a particular profession and you're worried that you're gonna be cut out of it, that you're gonna be blacklisted. So they're concerned and again, uh, external auditors often move from firm to firm if they find, um, you know, rocky ground in terms of, you know, paying someone paying attention to the concerns and the issues that they have. Only rarely do they actually take it to the brink. Um, one example is Mora Bata, who sued PwC for retaliatory termination, actually went to a trial, and then he lost. Mm -hmm. So... Every once in a while, you might have uh, an, uh, an external auditor or an internal auditor who becomes public. The majority of them don't necessarily um, have an easy time of it. Every once in a while, one is a good example. The good example, I would say, is um, uh, Diana Coons at KPMG, who was a partner who raised her hand and blew the whistle on the firm when it was uh, cooperating with uh, some executives that had hired from its regulator and was stealing regulatory data in order to get an advantage on its regulatory inspections. She realized that they were doing something wrong. She raised her hand. And of course, it resulted in really serious ramifications for those individuals. They were criminally prosecuted and uh, a fine for KPMG, the firm. However, KPMG, the firm is still thriving, still surviving, still auditing you know, major banks and major corporations. So what was the result? You took out a few people at the top and though they, they still have not gone to jail, uh, except for one uh, from the regulator. And other than that, it's business as usual. Fortunately, Diana Coons is still at KPMG. She's been promoted and she's wow. thriving. So she did the right thing. She also had a supportive uh, network. She was respected. She was at a level of the organization where she could solicit support um, based on her credibility or reputation. 
And as far as I know, things went well, but she doesn't talk to the press. She hasn't given an interview. Um, she's not willing, um, uh, apparently, to publicize her experience in order to encourage others. Hmm. She's a reluctant hand raiser. Right, right. The uh, Earlier we talked about investigative reporters and the role that they can play in trying to fill some of the gaps here. Um, can you talk about your time as an investigative reporter? And, and I'm, I'm especially interested in The Dig, uh, your, your online publication that you put out. What role do, do, uh, do investigative ro reporters play in all of this? So um, it's really a, uh, a wonderful um, thing that I was able to insinuate myself into another profession <laughs> um, and to sort of lo learn the ropes. Uh, fortunately, it wasn't a really big transition because we all operate on the same uh, wavelength. Um, we want to um, serve the public. We want to obtain, you know, sufficient evidence to support our contentions. We want to um, have an impact, um, a positive impact. And we want to make sure that we do that with integrity and objectivity and independence. So journal, investigative journalists and external auditors, uh, and also the approach I took as a consultant in a big four firm as a CPA, very similar, right? It was all very similar. But journalism is a little bit different because um, they have sort of their own ideas about why they're doing what they're doing. And um, many people are very, very well-intentioned, um, but they're um, only as effective as the organization um, that supports them. Mm -hmm. So you can have excellent investigative reporters, and if they're not in a supportive environment, if they're in an environment that's compromised, which is very common nowadays because big media is, op is owned by big corporations and private equity and others that have their own interest in the stories. Um, the individual uh, reporters may be very, very, very high integrity, but they may be squelched or suppressed in their pursuit of a story. Uh, you may not see the whole story. You may not see all the rough edges because there's a narrative, there's a story to tell, and it's a business, right? Journalism is a business. I um, personally uh, did not think of myself as an investigative reporter when I started. I started blogging because I wanted to talk about the business of the big four, which I thought was an undercovered area because it takes a certain level of experience and expertise. And most people that know about um, the business of the big four public accounting firms are either working that working there, so they're not going to talk, or um, they used to work there and they're beholden to them for one reason or another. They're either retired or they're still in the industry or in the business where they're obtaining uh, work or obtaining business or working cooperatively with the firms, and so they don't want to burn bridges. There are only a few people who have the expertise to be, for example, expert witnesses in plaintiff's cases against the auditors. Which ones can do that? Well, you have to have a sufficient level of expertise and credibility, but not owe your retirement income to one of the firms. Somebody like that is, for example, Lynn Turner, former SEC chief accountant, right? He never retired from PwC, so he doesn't owe them anything. So he can, give his opinion about things, and he has sufficient credibility. In my case, I was uh, at a level in the firms, in two different firms, where I was sort of a line manager. I had a view to the P&L. In PwC, I had a view to the inner workings of partner matters and all of the internal issues, in particular around independence. So I had that knowledge, but I left without being an equity partner who owed my, a retirement or any other uh, continuing co uh, compensation to the firms. I do own, owe an allegiance of confidentiality for the issues that I worked on while I was there. That's just professionalism. Um, but I don't owe any kind of ongoing allegiance in terms of protecting the industry or protecting the firms. So those people who actually have sufficient knowledge about this quirky industry, public accounting and consulting, um, and are free to speak about it are kind of few and far between. And even if you have that freedom and that knowledge, you may choose not to have that grief. And for whatever reason, I kind of grew into it 
And I enjoyed sort of starting to get um, the insights that I had about how things really work out there. People enjoyed it because nobody ever talks about it from a position of, of per personal experience or knowledge. Um, it was rare in the media. When I came, there was only one um, major media organization that had a dedicated accountancy reporter, and that was at the FT. Hmm. Um, over time, you had an FT in London, so not in the US. <laughs> over time, you had the Wall Street Journal um, put someone on a full-time beat at, as an accountancy reporter, Michael Rappaport, who was an excellent choice, did an excellent job for many years. And then again, in early 2015, decided that position was no longer needed because they're speaking to a general business audience and they really didn't want to get into all the technical accounting stuff. So they write a CFO journal. Okay, they write stories about the regulatory activities, the SEC from a regulatory perspective or a law enforcement perspective, but they don't really write about the business model of the firms, how they do business, the conflicts, only when something really blows up. Like, for example, now Ernst & Young is talking about splitting up again. That's a big story. That's right. a very big story. And now the FT has an accountancy reporter in the US, which is something I was telling them for 15 years they needed that there was enough to do. And I was recently told that the story about EY splitting up was worth the price of putting somebody on that on that beat full time. That was enough. It was a it's a story that's going to go on that's rich with activity. And that's not even withstanding the fact that you have auditors all over the FTX uh, crypto exchange blow up. That's not withstanding the fact that you have auditors all over, well, one in particular over all these bank failures, KPMG. That's not even withstanding the fact that you have stories like Wirecard that have a US nexus. You have all kinds of other frauds and, and corporate frauds here and SEC enforcement actions here against auditors. You have the crypto auditors doing these fake um, proof of uh, reserve reports that nobody can seem to get a handle on, uh, uh, on. So you have lots of stories and they're very glad they finally put someone in their place. But I came in and there was nobody covering this beat on a, on a regular basis in the US. And so that's why I found very fertile ground uh, as the financial crisis progressed and people became um, a little tired of, real, or they realized that it was more to the story than just some black swan cataclysmic event, you know, that nobody could predict that actually there was fraud in terms of how the banks had valued those mortgage backed securities and how they had um, uh, processed foreclosures and other issues with customers. So later we saw the fraud, later we saw what the auditors missed, later some of the auditors actually settled cases. Later, you saw big failures like Colonial Bank, where the FDIC sued the auditor successfully for the largest ever settlement against an auditor at trial against PwC. Um, that was much later after the crisis. It took a while for um, those cases to develop and for people to acknowledge that the crisis was about more than just, you know, some unpredictable economic event. So let's say one of your students uh, who has a passion for transparency and protecting investors comes to you and says, Professor McKenna, out of all of your different hats that you've worn at PwC, KPMG, and as an investigative reporter, and now as a professor, where can I make the biggest impact? Which one of these hats should I put on and where should I pursue my career? What do you say to that student? I would say that um, we need uh, two kinds of people, more of two kinds of people in the world. We need people who are good people with strong ethics, who want to think about the full stakeholder complement. We need those people leading corporations. We instead get people who, um, uh, whose rough edges are uh, filed off by the time they get to senior management yeah. and they are not, and, and it's, it's, it's bipartisan. It's not gender specific. Right. It doesn't matter who you are. 
if you can, uh, if you get to those levels in major public corporations, your 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 rough edges are sewn off. Unless you're somebody like Elon Musk or somebody who's just an iconic class that they don't they don't really care. They've gotten to a level of wealth and and success that they can act like you know uh, 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 a rabid individual <laughs> um but in general uh ceos of of public corporations are are conformists mm. our status quo conformists so we need more people who actually feel strongly about the good things about stakeholder values employees communities and the shareholders and want to do good business uh well and and properly we also um, need more people in the public accounting firms who actually want to be professionals and do the work of auditing and signing audit opinions the way it's intended. Mm -hmm. So again, I never tell anybody who wants to go in the firms and, and be an auditor or even a consultant or a tax professional, I never tell them don't go there. The firms are not, you know, they're failing at their job. They're not highlighting fraud. They're not, you know, they, they turn on their own employees when they, you know, point out their flaws. I would never tell them that because then we're leaving it to the dogs. I mm. want more good people to go in the firms. I want more people who see that it's a profession. It's an honorable profession. The intention was to protect investors and employees and customers and vendors and the communities. And we should be doing that work the way the rules, the standards are written, the way it's been intended with independence and objectivity. And we need people who can act that way all the way up the leadership chain. Again, you get people who are leading firms by the time they get to the top leadership of the firms, given the early retirement age in public accounting, in general, they retire at 60. That's the rule for retirement in the firms. And if you don't get yourself to a point where you're gonna, you have an idea, you're gonna be in a senior leadership role in the firms, um, you're probably gonna go out and find a role as a CFO or some other business leader outside of the firms. And if, if you have the aspiration to it for leadership, Otherwise, you could be a partner on individual audits for your whole career and have no big picture idea about anything that goes on. Just be working in your little tunnel vision, you know, operational, you know, my client, protecting my turf, my franchise, my team, et cetera. You're not really thinking about the implications of what you're doing. And you're basically doing as you're told in order to preserve your, your position. If you get to a leadership role in the firms, you may have six years. You may be chairman or a senior leadership in one of the big firms and you get four years at the senior leadership role. And then maybe you're going to go to the international firm for another four years. So six to eight years. Right. And again, it has to start early because retirement is 60. So if you're not in your early fifties on that path, okay, you're probably gonna, you're gonna go somewhere else. Now you can go to private equity. Now you can go to a VC firm. Now you can go to a audit committees at 15 banks. Okay. You have lots of choices, but if you get to that level of leadership, all you wanted to do is preserve the firm for the next generation. Mm -hmm. You don't want to change anything. You don't want to upset the apple cart. You don't want to start it down a new path. You don't want to think about a whole new way of approaching customers or, or, or the audit franchise. You don't want to think about revising regulation. You don't want to do anything. You just want to preserve the firm for the future, the next future, for as long as you're going to collect your share, a partnership of your deferred, of your deferred compensation. It's a very short termism kind wow, of thing. Interesting. Yeah. They're in they're in those jobs for a very short time. They've been handed them in trust from their other partners. And the idea is to preserve it for the retirees and for the next generation. And so that's the issue, for example, with the EY uh, uh, split situation. All of a sudden you have the retirees piping up and saying, you're screwing us. <laughs> 
We don't like this deal. You never asked us what we thought. We're dependent on the firm. We're still owners of the firm. And you're splitting it up and you're basically diluting our interest and you're allocating. And some of us are gonna get caught with all the liabilities from Wirecard and, and um, uh, 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 NMC and all the other European, I mean, they're not happy. They're not happy because they've not been considered. Mm -hmm. And so decisions that serve the current partners because they see a, a, a pot of money from IPOing the consulting arm and shedding the liabilities of the audit firm. And they see like an immediate opportunity for them is very, very short-sighted because they're not looking out for those who are still dependent on the firm who've retired, who are still pretty young. And for the next generation who says, well, what am I joining? Why, why would I join the firm? They're already having trouble recruiting people. We can't get enough people to study accounting we have fewer people taking the CPA exam and the firms are crying for recruits. Wow. Well, why are you surprised? Because right. they have such short term views and they've sacrificed the professionalism of the profession. They've traded it off for commercialism. And if you're gonna study and you're gonna spend that much time in school, why are you gonna go work in public accounting? You can make a lot more money in investment banking or private equity or starting your own business or just about anything. Hmm. If you're smart, right? If you're one of those top students, you have lots of choices. Right. Why sure. would you go in the situation where every few years they're splitting the firm up and the current partners are, take, are taking the cream off the top? Hmm. Well, Professor McKenna, if, if the goal is to get more uh, executives and people in accounting who embrace business integrity. I think you're in a great spot to influence a whole lot of people. <laughs> and I just acknowledge you for uh, taking on this important role for, for our country and for our markets and uh, for everything that we, we do uh, on our end as well. If, if, if you're able to put us out of business as fraud fighters because you're pushing out ethical business leaders, uh, that's a wonderful thing. <laughs> Sadly, uh, I think there will always be good people like you and my friend Jason Zuckerman and many of the other um, amazing attorneys who are helping people uh, wade through these, these challenging situations. I'm always there for them, but you know, I'm just a girl and God willing, um, you know, I live long enough to see another nice uh, positive turn and we get out of this sort of golden era of fraud again and mm -hmm. we start seeing businesses grow and people's uh people's uh savings grow and people being excited about getting out of uh graduating from college or graduating from business school and what's what lies ahead instead of the trepidation that sadly i see even in the most elite graduates of the top business schools they're nervous and it's unfortunate that it has to be that way amen well, until the next episode of Fraud in America, if you see something, say something. And when that doesn't work, make sure you do something. See you next time. If you believe you have witnessed fraud against the government or fraud on the financial markets, we encourage you to visit our website at taf.org, where you will find a directory of member attorneys who represent whistleblowers across the country. On our website, you will also find additional information about our nation's various whistleblower laws and programs and a way to donate to our organization as we step forward in spreading information about whistleblower programs. This episode was edited and produced by Rachel Brooks, and our theme song is by Connor Chaos. A big thank you to our TAF staff and researchers of James King, Emma Bass, Jackie DeMar, Kate Scanlon, Max Boldman. Fraud in America is a project of Taxpayers Against Fraud Education Fund. The opinions expressed on today's show belong solely to the guest and are not necessarily endorsed by the organization. Thank you for joining us on today's episode of Fraud in America.